very, a very happy hate your parents, wife, and children Sunday to all of you. <laughs> we live in a time of inflation, rising costs, and all of us know fully well what it's like to go shopping and fill up the gas tank. We're always looking at the cost. We're considering the cost of just about everything. Consider the cost and then we make a decision. Plan a vacation, we have to consider the cost. School supplies, all kinds of needs, we have to consider the cost. In the gospel today, Jesus wants us to be very clear and consider the cost of discipleship and make a decision. Jesus had no problem gathering large crowds. People were intrigued by his teaching, impressed with the authority at which he spoke, were amazed and wowed by his miracles, his healings, his casting out of demons, even raising people from the dead. Jesus knew how to draw a crowd. And today in the gospel, Jesus is still being followed by great crowds. But it's the great crowd that he addresses with these really shocking words. If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What is Jesus talking about? Is Jesus actually calling us to hate? Obviously, no. But he is using a rabbinic style of teaching to create shock in the ears of his listeners. He wants everyone's attention, and it still impacts us greatly today. Jesus speaks to these crowds to find out who are going to be the real disciples. It's easy to have a great crowd. Jesus had no problem with that. It was very popular. But are we fair-weather fans of Jesus or are we true followers of Jesus? The fair weather fan of, you know, sure, it's good to be with Jesus and be a Christian and pray on occasion and worship when it's convenient, when the weather's fair, it's easy to be a follower of Christ. Not as long as, just as long as it doesn't too, demand too much from me. But Jesus didn't come to draw great crowds. He came to call true disciples, true followers, those who will place Jesus at the very center of their lives. Jesus' words today in the gospel challenge the greatest and most important of earthly relationships, the most important of earthly loves, love of parents and spouses and children and even one's own life. Jesus is saying, basically, if you love any of those more than me, you cannot be my disciple. Take up your cross and follow me. The cross was a scandal. In the first century Judaism, they saw many criminals crucified. We don't have an appreciation of this kind of thing. But to say, pick up your cross and follow me was also shocking. The closest thing we have to that analogy is, pick up your electric chair and come follow me. That's weird and creepy to worldly ears. But Jesus is saying, are you willing to bear hardships and trials for the sake of me? Will you pick up your cross and follow me? Will you renounce all of your possessions if you need to, to follow me? And basically what Jesus is doing is trying to find out just how committed we are. Have you and I really, truly surrendered our lives to Jesus? Say, well, I'm committed to going to church. I pray during the day, you know, that's good. I'm involved in the parish. All of that is wonderful. But have I surrendered my life to Jesus? Is he at the center of my life? Or is he only part of my life? You see, Jesus doesn't want to just be one priority among others, one value among others. Jesus challenges the very core of the most important relationships that we have. And in Judaism, faith and family were inseparable. 
If you were a Jew, you were in the family and you were in the faith. You were the chosen people. And so for Jesus to even challenge the devotion of family relationships was certainly shocking for Jewish ears. We might look at the gospel today and say, okay, well, you know what? I'm really all that, not all that close to my parents anymore. Anyway, that relationship isn't such a challenge. And if you fought with your spouse and your kids on the way to Mass today, you're probably like, well, yeah, that's not a big deal either. <laughs> but what are the relationships in our lives that, that claim our loyalties? Is it being a Republican or a Democrat or a follower of the LGBTQ community? Is it being a liberal or being a conservative? Is it being the company man or company woman, the boss's right-hand colleague? Is it a golf club, a country club, a book club? What are the relationships that claim our loyalties? We just spent two months of summertime. How easy it is for us to concede on going to Mass on Sundays when we find ourselves with family and friends that don't go to church. It's easier to not make a fuss about it. You see, those are all the relationships that begin to claim the center of our hearts. What Jesus wants is to be in the middle. Jesus wants to be the center of our lives. Not one value among many, not priority among many, but that if Jesus is at the center of my life, then he guides the way in which I love everybody else and everything else properly. Jesus puts all love in its proper context. Jesus wants us to love our families. It's a commandment. The fourth commandment, honor your parents. But he does say the greatest commandment is to love God with your whole heart, mind, and strength. And is that the way we're living? That's what Jesus wants from us. And so we have to really look at where we put our loyalties. What causes us to change and divert our lives? Is it Jesus, really? You know, the saints all got this right in the end. They put Jesus at the center. They gave themselves in total surrender to God. And they loved and were on fire with the love of God. And one saint that we can look to as a great example today is one that is commonly misunderstood by a lot of sentimentality, but St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis lived in a town called Assisi in northern Italy. He was born around 1184. But we look at St. Francis today, it's like, well, you know, we kind of just imagine him just as a little simpleton bouncing around and picking flowers up and talking to animals and birds. Yes, he loved creation. Yes, he was a gentle spirit, but he was a spiritual warrior. When he was a young man, he lived a very party-crazed kind of life. He was a wild child. And he joined the army and fought some wars, participated in one of the crusades and then at one point in his early life, he began to be attracted to the poor in the streets of Assisi and identify with them and began to serve them as he heard God inviting him to do so. And then at the age of 26, he was in a church, St. Damien Church, and was praying before a crucifix. And Jesus spoke to St. Francis and said, Francis, go and repair my church. So Francis thought he literally meant the St. Damien Church, which was a bit dilapidated. So he started to fix up this church building and then realized that he was later being called to build up the church in spiritual renewal, to evangelize and renew souls, to draw souls to Jesus. And he began to be more and more committed to Christ. He kept making decisions and cutting off the attachments of his life so that he could be fully united to Jesus. And at one point, his father got really mad and brought his son Francis to the bishop's court and in public demanded that Francis give back the money that he used to fix up St. Damien Church. So Francis conceded his father's request. But then 
he took off all of his clothes and stripped himself down naked in front of the bishop and his father and the public, and he gave his clothing back to his father, a rich and wealthy cloth merchant, and said, I renounce my family and all of my possessions to be totally poor in order to live and serve with the poor, to totally identify with Jesus, he literally became poor in every possible way. Now, most of us would probably look at this and say, this guy's crazy. And it looked that way to worldly eyes. Francis lost his mind. But did he? Many, many young men followed St. Francis, and in a few years, thousands and thousands of men joined a religious order now known as the Orders of Friars Minor, the Franciscans, that were approved in 1210 by Pope Innocent III. People wanted to live this life with this man, and Francis did, despite what we often commonly misattribute to him, use lots and lots of words to preach and evangelize and to win souls for Jesus, to live as a healer, a spiritual warrior. He did this, but it was all based on the reality that he put Jesus at the center. He literally renounced his family and all of his possessions. Now, we, not, we may not be called to this kind of life exactly as Francis was, but we are called and invited into this relationship with Jesus to place him at the center. Jesus invites us into the highest love possible, the love of God. Jesus calls us beyond earthly relationships, beyond earthly loves. And what so often happens is that those loves and those relationships pull us away from God. And Jesus doesn't want this. St. Francis, toward the end of his life, received the stigmata, the five wounds of Jesus on his body. So close and so in love with Jesus was St. Francis that he wanted to identify with Jesus in every way. And he's one of the most amazing and popular well-known saints still in 2022. You see, the saints all knew the secret to joy-filled happiness, to amazing divine love. They put Jesus at the center. They considered the cost. They looked at the cost of discipleship. They realized the cost was great. But even more so, they realized the gain. To gain God is to gain everything. So let's ask the saints today, St. Francis of Assisi, to help us see where we need to break attachments, what relationships and what loyalties need to be detached from our hearts so that Jesus can be at the center, so that Jesus can be everything for us, the foundation of our lives. So let's consider the cost. Make a decision. Fairweather fan or true disciple. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen.